Uh, I don't know if this is too distracting if the light is in my face. Maybe it's okay. No, 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 I mean the uh, projector. <laughs> if, I, if I get too close, it's a little bit. It's good, Brent. And, uh, and also, yeah. <laughs> I also asked uh, Ziv to, to run the slides for me, so I'll be winking at him. So please don't think I'm winking at any of you. It's <laughs> just to get him to change the slides. All right. Uh, feels like I should stand up just for the Jiko Shoka. Everyone, uh, yeah, so first off, uh, thanks Ziv for having me here. Um, this is actually, a, I think, a really cool event. Um, I hope it's the first of many, um, not just here in Fukuoka, but around Japan. I think, uh, you know, activities like this, um, you know, like Jason said, are necessary, I think, for us to, to be able to expand our careers and, and meet new people. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm the, basically the, the president of Sakura Phoenix. I'll explain uh, what this company is. I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'll explain what the product is that, uh, that I make. Um, and then I'll actually share a bit of personal stuff with you. So this story might be a bit um, hopefully interesting, but you know, uh, there's, some, there's some moments in the story that I haven't really shared with other people. But I think it's important to be honest with people so that you have an understanding of what happens to get to a moment where you have a product. Um, because it's not all kind of roses and, and, and sunshine. There's some, some dark moments in there too, but I think we learn through that adversity. All right, so this, uh, I've actually got a lot of slides. Uh, lots of winking. Yeah, <laughs> lots of, um, how, much, how much time, what's, what's um, we, let's make it an hour. All right. And let's some time for Q&A. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, we'll, you guys let me know if, if it's dragging on, then but just, you, you guys wink at me and then I'll, I'll just speed it up. All right. You need to move your, your in the projector. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Either this way or that way. <laughs> yeah, I thought so, but it's, it's a little bit harder for me to, uh, all right, I, I'll just take it here. Right I think I know what's, what slides are coming up anyway since I made it. All right, so yeah, uh, I've lived in Japan. Um, this is actually a little bit inaccurate. It says I've been here for 15 years, uh, probably around 17, so about the same. Um, I have a background in uh, B2B international sales, uh, business development. Um, I came here actually as an English teacher, as maybe a lot of the foreign community here has. Um, and I lived in Nagoya. Didn't know that was there. <laughs> I lived in Nagoya for 13 years uh, with my family. All right, um, so my company has uh, at this point two products. A third one is in production. Um, today we'll be talking mainly about Golden Age of Pirates. I'll explain to you what this is, how it came to be, and then give you a bit of the behind the scenes of kind of what, uh, how it developed. But actually I want you to think about, um, I'll just stop here for a second, and think if anyone in this room um, has ever made a game or made any kind of product. You have? I made an escape room. Wow, okay, that's pretty cool. All right. Okay, and I think you also raised your hand too? Yeah, made a basic like RPG. Okay, okay. So I'd like for you actually, as I tell you the story, to just think about whatever game you might want to make. And then uh, at the end of the story, I'd like for you to raise your hand and tell me if you still want to make that game. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, so Golden Age of Pirates, uh, it's not just me, there's a team of people. Uh, I've got a very young uh, director for this project. Uh, this is my son, his name is Phoenix. Uh, that's me, David uh, Mazucci is the uh, lead artist. Uh, Mariko, uh, actually is my wife, uh, is, uh, she does the anime concept design, and then my best friend, uh, Ben, from Australia. Um, he's an editor who does the editing for the anime scripts, uh, books, and other things like that. All right, so basically what is game with the Golden Age of Pirates? It's a stra naval strategy game. So the objective is you have a fleet of ships that you move across a board. Um, you have cards that represent the ships, and then you manage the crew on those ships to do the things that you want. And you can basically attack uh, or repair damage or sail around the board. That's the simplest way I can explain it. Um, it's an original game. As far as I know, there is no game that has the same kind of mechanic as this. So uh, I did bring uh, an actual uh, sample for you guys to play. I really hope that you uh, have a chance to play it while you're here and give me some honest feedback on what you think. All right, so let's start with the story. Sorry. Uh, oh, and also in addition to that, there's also a, uh, a book series. Um, and I'm currently optioning an anime series as well. So hopefully, 
Um, at some point, you'll see this on, like, say, a Netflix or Amazon Prime. Uh, but right now, that's still work in progress. Side, side thing there. Yep, the sure. founder of Business in Japan in 2009 is currently the head of anime at Netflix. And you yeah. need to introduce me to that person. <laughs> 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 All right, thank you guys for coming out. I'll see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> uh, yeah, Netflix is actually a very difficult company to engage with. I've got some good buddies that work there too, but uh, that's good to know. All right, so let's start with the story. It's 2019. Uh, man, that just. What, what, I mean, just before COVID, right? It was such a great time to be alive. <laughs> um, I'm living in Nagoya. That's actually my daughter. Her name is Sakura. So now you understand Sakura Phoenix, right? Um, and I'm actually running a real estate business, which apparently is the thing to do. Um, and also a corporate relocation services uh, company as well. So life is good. Um, it's a good job. Yeah. But um, I'm thinking of kind of moving out of this career into something in Tokyo. Um, but things are relatively more okay? Now, around this time, because um, I'm traveling to Tokyo so much, I only have a limited amount of time to spend with my kids, and I wanted to do something that would basically connect us um, as they got older. So my son uh, actually draws a lot, and one day, I just happened to look at the table, and he was drawing a picture, mm -hmm. um, and it was a skull king. Uh, or actually, it was a skeleton guy, and this isn't the, his original picture. So I, I went back and I redid it. Um, but I just, I'm like, what is this? And he goes, Oh, it's the Skull King. And he said it so like nonchalantly, like I should know who this character is. And um, I just, I thought it was such an interesting concept. And I start to talk to him and kind of flesh out. Well, if he's a king, he has a kingdom. And if he has a kingdom, then like, who lives there? And if there's a kingdom, then what's around it? And before we knew it, we basically built this, this world that was a fantasy world. And that was it. It was just kind of a way to kind of play with him kind of, you know, after school. Um, then <laughs> we get to uh, summer 2020, right? Um, now, what I should mention is what happened was I moved from Tokyo. I took a job um, in Tokyo. Sorry, I moved from Nagoya to Tokyo, and it didn't work out. It was, it was actually a really, really probably bad move at the time. So I found myself unemployed before COVID hit. So if you can imagine what that feels like to imagine if anyone, did anyone actually change jobs in the last two years, anyone? Right, was it, was it from COVID related, right? So imagine changing your job before that and going into COVID unemployed. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine um, January 2020, mm -hmm. now I'm ready to go back and look for work, and February goes by, you hear about this virus, now you're in March, no one's hiring. Mm -hmm. So for the first time since I was 14, I didn't have a job. I have a wife and two kids, you know, car note. It's quite scary. Um, and so I'm living in Tokyo, and I don't have a job, and I've got a lot of free time. And I start to think about my son's skulking. And so I start to have Zoom calls with him every night, and we just keep working on this. We keep making this world. And this is basically what we came up with. This was the, the world that he created. Some of the places uh, are a bit silly, like um, that's Curry Island. So I actually that's let him. That's actually, actually it's me. I love Indian curry. Um, but he had some. He had some really great concepts, and I can honestly say this. This is my son's world, and it's really hard to not like hijack, um, you know, your kid's project. Like there's a lot of like helicopter parents that will do that, but this is his world, and the game is his game, you know. And I just put a lot of work into it to polish it. Okay, so we basically looked at the map, and there were a lot of like sea spaces, and we thought, man, it would be really cool to make a game inside of that world, right? And so we made this. Uh, this is actually the original board, and you know we had some islands, we had some things that eventually are not in the game because they're a little bit too difficult to explain in board games. But this was the first map, and we had some pieces that he had from like Lego, and we just put the Legos on the board. We even had like some of the little Lego figures, and, and that was the first version of this game. Um, we played it, we balanced it, we got to a point where it was actually fun to play, but we were basically playing on cutout paper. This game had cost me nothing at this point. 
All right, so we got to a point where I thought, wow, we actually have a game, right? This actually, this game works. It's original. We, we love playing it, but it, no one's going to come over to my house and play it if it's cut out on paper. So I need to hire a professional artist. So um, at this point, I'm going to say, all right, think about that game I asked you to make, okay? So I don't know what your game is, but you're probably going to need some professional art for it. Now, there's a couple different ways to source an artist. You probably know an artist. Um, I would actually recommend probably not to do that because that relationship at the end of this process will probably not exist <laughs> because you know it, it changes the relationship um, to, to them being an employee of yours. The two easiest ways, I think, to source an artist um, is one is Instagram. Instagram is all about influencers and you know, but also people that are creative that you can hire. Um, and then also, this is a, a website called Fiverr, if anyone has used this. I haven't used it personally, but you can find almost anybody who does anything, and you can see exactly what they charge and what their portfolio is. So just this is the first of the tools I'll recommend to, to source. Now, you also have to figure out, all right, now this is where the money starts to come in, okay? At this point, I've only spent, you know, 10 cent or 10 yen copying things at 7-Eleven. At, uh, there's two ways to pay. So you can do a profit sharing, which is I pay you nothing, and if this thing sells, I give you X percent of whatever revenue or profit. And then the other one is a lump sum. So just between us, what I did in this case is a profit share. So I found an artist, and I said, okay, I'm not gonna pay you anything up front, but whatever this turns out to be, you'll have a percentage of it. And I'll tell you later on if that was a good idea or not. So I found my artist, <laughs> and his name is uh, David uh, Mizuchi. That's actually him in the uh, cow costume. I'm not sure if that was a real picture that he modeled or not. But David uh, is actually a really talented artist, as you probably can tell. He has a lot of different art styles. He's a really creative guy. Um, and actually, I knew him. So this wasn't someone that I met on Instagram or, or uh, Fiverr. Um, I would see him at Starbucks doodling, and I just thought, this is the guy that I, I want to populate this world. As if, can you tell me that's one? Right. So I, brought, I bring him on board, he starts working, and wow, like it was an amazing experience. Like, you know, my, my son and I wanted this world to be set in a, in a fantasy world, so it's not steampunk. It's not based on actual, any real uh, era in time. So it had to have this, this fantasy um, aesthetic to it. And uh, David got together with us, and it was just an amazing experience. So we made all the assets for the game. And at that point, I think we were ready to actually start making a prototype. Okay. Um, this game actually had three different versions. Um, the 1.0 version. And then uh, eventually I call this 2.0, but really there was one in between it. Um, so the first thing I'll tell you is when you make your game, before you prototype, you need to revise it as many times as possible because there will be mistakes, there will be things that you wish you had done better. Before you invest money in that first prototype, please do as much of this on pencil and paper as you possibly can. All right. So then what you want to do is find someone to manufacture your game. I have a nice little list here for you that I've put together, but you could just Google board game manufacturers, and then you realize, wow, this is actually a big industry. And I'm a guy who, like, I played Monopoly in life and some of the older games. I've, I've missed 30 years of evolution for games. So there's a whole ecosystem set up for this. Okay? So... I contacted, it's okay, I contacted one of the companies that are on that list. One thing I would mention to you is most of those companies, as you can imagine, are based in China, um, which actually works out well for us because when shipping got bad um, to North America, because my company that I chose was in China, I didn't really have any of the shipping issues. So last year, I, uh, I received uh, my prototype, which actually I brought here today. Uh, I'll ask you not to open it because it's got a bunch of loose stuff in there and it'll fall out. But this, this, is, this was the prototype that arrived. And um, so I've got two kids, and I can tell you that when you, when you ever like, witness a childbirth, it's a really strange feel. I'll say strange, because you're happy, and there's it's all these emotions, but you're like, oh shit, I have to, like, have to do something with this, with this baby. And that's what this was like. It was, it was so exciting to have this thing that now was in you know, three dimensions that was a real thing that started off as you know crayons and now it was a real thing but now I've got to do something with this because it exists right 
So you start to go out and you start to play test it, right? So I start to have people go out and play my game. And everyone that I, you know, that played it said it was, it was a great game. So it's, we're doing well. So I thought, all right, I need to incorporate. I need to make a company. I need to make this something that is um, that I can protect myself with. So I basically made a website. I got business cards, social media. I went, hired a specialist to incorporate. I got my stamps, had my capital together. I even got a bank account for my company, which is very difficult to do. Um, mm -hmm. If anyone's ever had that experience, you typically start with like a personal account, um, but I actually have a Sakura Phoenix um, bank account. Um, and the advice I would give you is to go to a smaller bank. If you walk into UFJ, they're gonna just like kick you out. So you gotta go to one of those like smaller ones that <laughs> uh, will do that. But be aware that they most likely will not let you do international um, transactions. Right, this is a big issue, so just be aware of that. Now, this affects my business because, as you can tell, my company, uh, my board game is made in China, so that makes it very difficult to do those kinds of transactions. And then, most of my customers are actually outside of Japan, right? So, that causes a few trouble, a few problems there. So, I made Sakura Phoenix, I'm the president, uh, but I have no revenue, so it's like, oh, great, and I'm also unemployed. So my wife <laughs> says, take your ass to Hello Work and ask them either for a job or to get basically unemployment insurance. Um, now this is where the story is going to take a bit of a turn because I think I do have a bit of uh, maybe ego or pride. I really didn't want to ask the government to give me money, but I've also lived in this country at that point for 15 years and I thought I've been paying into employment insurance, so this is my money. So I go into Hello Work with my wife and I sit down, I fill all the paperwork and they go, hey, great news, um, you qualify for three months of unemployment insurance and because of COVID, you get an extra three months. And I'm thinking, this is amazing. This is great. I'm going to actually have a way to support my family while I build my business. The very last tick box on the application says, do you own a company? Oh. And guess who had just incorporated a company one month before that? And my Japanese wife says, you need to tick that box. And I'm like, I don't want to tick that box. <laughs> she goes, tick the box. So I tick the box, everything shuts down, and they go, because you are the owner of a company, you, you qualify for no government support. Holy shit. I have two kids, a wife, no job. I'm starting to spend money now on this thing. Um, this, is, this is crossroad time. So already, this is starting to, to start to cause a little bit of, of friction. And it's a very scary situation, right? Because we still have COVID, still have no job. I'm living in Tokyo alone, don't have my family, my support system. So this was actually a really, really dark time. So <laughs> this is, uh, if anyone's ever seen Mad Max, one of my favorite movies, it's like a society without rules. This was, this is how I felt, you know, it was like, not to say that's my wife, because that's not, <laughs> she's not, we actually have a really good relationship right now, but I thought, you know, I'm, for the first time in my life, I have no tether, there's nothing, you know, my destiny is in my, is in my hands right now, so I can either go back to what I was doing, or I can just say, hey, let's, let's just ride this thing until the wheels fall off, and that's what we're doing. All right, so let's let's make this game, all right? And uh, we'll see if, if it gets done or not. All right, so <laughs> all right, the first thing you need to do is you need to raise money and quickly or you're gonna be bankrupt, all right? So luckily, uh, we have crowdfunding. Does anyone know what crowdfunding is? Everyone familiar with crowdfunding? All right, so um, what, what crowdfunding platforms are you familiar with? GoFundMe. GoFundMe, Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Okay, and so in Japan, this is interesting, it's not so common, right? Most people in Japan don't quite know about, about crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. So I actually have, can you go to the next slide? Um, GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, mm -hmm. um, and in Japan, Campfire. Mm -hmm. Campfire. Now, I didn't know about Campfire at this time. This is actually, at this point, December of uh, 2019, I think, when I started this, right? And most of my uh, network, half is in Japan, half is in America. So Indiegogo and Kickstarter were the only two platforms I thought that had a good founding in both countries. Does anyone know the difference between Indiegogo and Kickstarter? Now, this is a very important part. All right, so remember that game you're gonna make, okay? You're gonna crowdfund this game, all right? Indiegogo, the way it works is you set the goal, of how much money you need to make, and then you put the project up and people start to donate money. 
And if you don't hit the goal, you still get the money. Mm -hmm. So if you say you need to make $1,000 and you only get 998, then you get $998, okay? So I want you to choose. So your game, you're gonna make this game, and you can go with Indiegogo or Kickstarter. Kickstarter, you set the goal. If you don't hit that goal, zero. Everyone gets their money back, you get nothing, okay? So Indiegogo, you choose if you wanna get the money or not, Kickstarter, okay? So just off of that, let's see by raising of hands. For your game that you're gonna make, you wanna crowdfund it, and I'm sorry, but I'm limiting your options to two. Uh, who's gonna go with Indiegogo? All right, all right. Who's gonna go with Kickstarter? All right, interesting. The people who said Kickstarter, why, why did you say Kickstarter? I've never heard of Indiegogo before, so I would be very, very okay. cautious about um, the audience that I could actually reach with Indiegogo. And so okay. Kickstarter, I would okay. just imagine that I have a bigger audience with bigger possibilities. Okay, so more name recognition, maybe a little more trust. Okay. Probably like, if I couldn't raise that money, mm -hmm. like I feel like I would have to go out about it another way. Okay. Like, if there's not enough, interest on that platform, well, fine, we'll go about another way, but, yeah. Okay. If you did get to the point where you were like, I don't know, $100 short, like, I'd probably just put it in myself or yeah. friend, but mm -hmm. if it's like, honestly getting, say you wanted to raise a thousand, you got 300, well, mm -hmm. it's not getting right. enough, right? And I think this, this way, it tells you really if, if yeah. you're going to sink or swim. So you don't have to sell your game, but most people do. Right? So if you contribute to my, kick, my, my Kickstarter or my Indiegogo, then as a reward, I give you my game. So it's it's kind of like Pachinko in the way that you're not selling a product, but you're kind of selling a product, right? Mm -hmm. So here's what happens. Let's say that I set my goal, I need to make Goju Manen. And that's to the minimum order that I can make and have a profit. If I go with Indiegogo and I don't hit that goal, and half of you have already bought my game, now the cost to make my game goes higher because I'm not making the same quantity. So I'm actually losing money by selling you my game. So be very careful about this, okay? And either way, it's a legal commitment, right? Once yes. you've received money. Yes. So people can actually sue you if you don't, if you don't yes. deliver. Yes, yes. Uh, now, as you'll find out with, kicks, with these crowdfunding, everything gets delayed. Every, they're all late, so that's not the issue. People. Um, tend to not sue, but if you just never give anyone the product, then that's a problem. So I went with Kickstarter for that reason, for that reason, right? Mm -hmm. I had never heard of really Indiegogo. I thought if this doesn't work, it doesn't work, but I knew that if I don't hit my goal, I'm gonna end up losing money very quickly. Okay. All right, so I made a Kickstarter, um, and this was just a test. This was just to see what the power of my network was and also what the power of this platform was. I honestly thought that this would take off, Kickstarter would promote me, and then I would be having you know hundreds of thousands of dollars coming in very soon. One of the games that we have downstairs is, uh, what is it, the Kittens game? Exploding Kitten. Exploding Kitten. It's one of the highest um, crowdfunding projects of all time. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy's like a multi-millionaire now. Um, and I saw that and thought, oh, that's me. Here we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, so I made, I made my Golden Age of uh, Pirates page. And um, I made some, uh, some uh, reward uh, tiers, so you could buy the box, you could buy the t-shirt, you could buy um, the, the book, and then I had other music and things here. Now here's what I want to tell you. For your game, you actually make more money by not selling your game, all right? So this game, any game really, the, the profit margin on a board game is, for the general consumer, is not very high. If it's a niche market, um, and, you, and you have a game that has 3D sculpted pieces and things like that, you can probably have a much higher margin, but really a board game, you don't make this because you want to be filthy rich. Um, so, wait one second, sorry. Um, so basically, you have a tier that's just to donate. Maybe it's, it's a thousand yen, and you have digital content. So digital content, as you can imagine, there's no cost associated with it beyond the first product. So that's what you want to do. So whatever game you have in your mind, start thinking to make it as much digital as you can uh, because these will cost money. All right. All right. So I started my uh, Kickstarter. I did some research. Your Kickstarter campaign should be about 30 days. I think most campaigns that are about 30 days tend to be more successful because you have a shorter lead-in time. Um, and then I also found out that starting on like a Tuesday to Thursday, 
uh, between 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, is the best time because people typically have a lot of things to catch up on on Mondays, weekends, no one's checking their phone. Friday, everyone wants to start the weekend, right? So that's your sweet spot. So start between Tuesday and Thursday and uh, go for a 30 day, one month campaign. That's Eastern Standard Time because you were marketing. Yeah, so I was looking at most of my network was in North America. Yeah. So that's when I wanted it to hit. Mm -hmm. And I think what I ended up doing was having mine start at midnight in Japan. So yeah, my, my Kickstarter started like December 1st um, in Japan time. All right, so first first day I I, uh, I got I got probably Juman in um, first day I'm like here we go, and it was my mom it was my friends my best friend and then after like three days I started to get people that I didn't know, and this is what I was I was looking forward to it's gonna go viral here we go, and so I got this is actually emails that are from my Kickstarter, so I got a guy named Ryan and Ashley and. And yeah, it was like they all were going to help me, but then at some point they would turn into trying to sell me their services to market my project. And this is when I realized how crowdfunding works, is it's a pay to play system. Unless you have a very strong social media presence like Oatmeal, because he's got his own uh, platform, you're paying a company to basically jam the mailbox or the ballot box with tons of, of pledges and there may be a dollar each so if you know ashley gives me a thousand um pledges suddenly kickstarter realizes wow there's a new project that is big then they promote it that's how it goes viral but you have to pay for that service and i wasn't going to do that so, so just, those are all real services they would actually provide you you don't know you don't some know. some you know some are actually really sketchy um, I mean, it's, it's like a bot wrote it. Mm -hmm. And then some, like this guy right here, really was talking to me and it was actually selling me on the product, mm -hmm. on his service. But um, I just looked at all of them as I'm not paying you guys mm -hmm. because I can't tell which of you are real and which are scammers. Mm -hmm. And I just, I want to see how far this goes on my own. Mm -hmm. But if I had hired one of those companies, I think I would have ended up performing a lot better mm -hmm. if I got a legitimate company. All right, so my Kickstarter uh, hit my goal within like the first nine days, and I just thought, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kick back and work on something else. Um, now it's gonna go viral and, you know, we're off to the races. And what I found out was that when I wasn't sending emails to people, like people weren't pledging. So I have to individually message people. I can put something on Facebook, but no one's reading it. So I'm messaging you i think i messaged you directly probably right so you, you message people directly you did i appreciate that and that was when i got the results is when i individually reached out to people and made that connection but now you're starting to see this is a lot of work and this took over all of my time so for 30 days marketing just was out of control sales out of control so this is where it starts to become a real full-time job that's not making or playing with games so that game that you're thinking about making right now, understand that probably 10% of it is making the game. The rest of it is promoting it, right? So think about that. All right, so we hit our goal, things are going well, and I'm seeing a plateau. So I start to realize I need to make more incentives for people to pledge. That's the next slide. And so I start to make um, just more materials to explain what the game is. All of this is put on Kickstarter, all these things I have to make myself. Um, and then I start to make stretch goals. And what these are is just a way for people to feel like they still can help you to reach another level, right? And you give them something in return. Right, and so what I wanted to do also was reach out to local Nagoya artists. So this is a friend of mine named Robert Moore. Um, you might actually know Robert, he's in Tokyo a lot these days. Um, this is a local Chicago artist, actually a cousin of mine. And so getting local people to work with me to promote their, um, products and kind of get a synergy going right so we raised uh, and actually a little bit more came in after this so just about a million yen came in um, but the analytics that you get from Kickstarter are really great so I really recommend to spend the time to study where your leads are coming from um, all that data is actually very valuable and I learned a lot within that first 30 days about is this something that I really want to do and if I want to do this well I have to pay to do it 
but this is very much a B2C model, so it's me selling to individual people. I did the math and I realized I'm not gonna make it where I wanna make it with this model, because it takes too much time. All right, so um, I think this is a good place to just pause, because this is where I had to make um, kind of a decision, all right? So I've made the Kickstarter, I've got you know, um, you know 100 units in, in the can now, but I need to really find a way to sell this to companies, right? Um, can you show it to the next slide? So I start to test it again. And your game, you need as many people to test your game as possible. Um, so there's a platform to do that. Board Game Arena, you can basically put your game on this platform and people can play it, they can give you feedback. Uh, it's a really great platform. I personally did not use it. Um, but I do recommend that if you have a game that you can try doing this to have it tested as many times as possible. So I went with the B2B model. Again, this is kind of what my experience has been is selling to companies. There's a number of companies that have uh, you know, huge footprints. Hasbro is one of the biggest in the world. Um, Asmodee, I think it's a French company, is huge. And actually they just bought the uh, board game arena earlier this year. So you know, these are massive companies that basically you can use to, to get your reach. In Japan, you have some publishers that also can help you to get your games out. Um, Hobby Japan and Arclight are probably two of the biggest ones. Uh, Japan Brand uh, has a good relationship with a lot of German uh, publishers, so if you wanna actually sell your game um, overseas, look for a publisher in Japan that has a good footprint or a connection with an overseas company. Um, now, you can also try to go direct. And this is going directly to retailers, right? So all of these companies actually have a board game section, which I found really surprising because I didn't know that board games were that popular in Japan. But every single Don Quixote has a board game section. They have like Catan, they've got Monopoly, they've got Jinsei Game, um, Big Camera as well, Costco, Yodobashi, Amazon as well. So you have resources. Um, Amazon is probably the easiest to set up. Um, Costco is probably the hardest because if you're not an established um, IP, if you don't have a brand that people know, they're probably not going to purchase you know, 10,000 units of your unheard of game. But they do have a game section um, and they do have a person whose job it is to basically order toys and games. So they have a person who is looking for a game like yours. Okay, now the other thing I'll say is that um, most of those companies are not going to really take you seriously. So it's really about who you know and who can get you to the decision maker. And that's where, that's where, that's where the networking comes in. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I made this yesterday before I knew you too. Ah. <laughs> um, so I do recommend, oh, sorry, I do recommend uh, the Tokyo Chamber of Commerce and Industry if you want to get into those Japanese companies I mentioned. If you want to get into like the Toys R Us, the Costco's, the, uh, the Hasbro's, um, the ACCJ, which actually I used to work at, is a really great uh, marketing or not marketing, but a networking uh, platform and then uh, also business in Japan, right? So keep in mind that the network is, is vital um, because if you don't know someone, then you become that bot who's just in someone's mailbox they're ignoring yeah. because they're all getting jammed with, with emails. So right going back to the networking. Thing, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so again, uh, you know, one year later and this is my production model. So this is, this is Golden Age of Pirates. Um, this is a brand new game that I actually, you're the first ones to see this model. Uh, this will be the one that all the Kickstarter people get. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want, you probably could open this up, just try not to spill out too much of it. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. But uh, again, it was just a really great moment to, to have a product that is complete, it's finished. Um, it took about two years from the first drawing to this box arriving, um, and I'm really happy with the end result. And my feeling is that you'll see this on shelves, hopefully in the next year, and I hope if you see it, you buy two copies. <laughs> <laughs> one that you just keep uh, you know, in, your, uh, in your vault, and then one that you play with your family as much as possible. Okay, and so basically, um, again, if you're gonna start your own business in the modern era, you really have to have a good grasp on your marketing, on your social media management. Um, and one quick thing I'll say is I've actually scrubbed almost all social media for uh, Golden Age of Pirates, 
and from Antheon. And the reason why is if you go to a company like a Hasbro and they say, okay, that's great. Um, how many followers do you have? And if that number is not amazing, then actually it is going to hurt you. Right? The same thing with your Kickstarter. I, I will not do a Kickstarter for Pantheon at this point because unless I knock the number, you know, if I make you know forty thousand dollars or hundred thousand dollars, anything less than that shows them that this is not a product that they probably had that, that has mass appeal. So just be aware that sometimes, um, unless you really strategically look at your marketing campaign, your social media management, if you do this um, half-assed, it's actually going to hurt you in the long run. So really think about the marketing. It's probably going to take ninety percent of of your uh, of your time. Okay, and again, so yeah, I'm just really excited um, for everyone to play Golden Age of Pirates. I hope hope you have a chance to uh, to read uh, Pantheon. This is an earlier copy. The the cover is not the final, but the inside of the book um, is, and that's the North American size. So the North American comics are a bit larger than Japanese ones. Um, and full color, which is also very rare for Japan. Okay, so again, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Hopefully that wasn't too long. That was perfect. I just want to ask one question now. So, those of you that have your game, how many of you now want to follow this process to make that game? How about the people who say no? No, I'm not. I'm not doing this. This is this is too much. Raise your hand. It's okay. The labor of love. You know, it's not yeah. something that you're going to be doing to make a profit. Uh, well, unless you're very late in the process, right? Yeah, I mean, I actually could be looking at uh, being in a different tax bracket very soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if you go B to B, yeah. right? Which is what I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, if I get the contracts that I'm in discussions with now, it could it could change my entire family's mm -hmm. fortunes for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're going to go B to C, like you know, using your own platform, Instagram. Um, I live in Roppongi in uh, Tokyo, and it's full of 20-year-old <laughs> kids in Lamborghinis, and they're all Instagram influencers. So if you find a way, you find your niche, you can find a way to generate a lot of revenue. But you're right, selling the box itself is not is yeah. not what it's about. Yeah. That's not where the profit comes in. I, I really feel you because I have quite a similar story with Corona, not everything. Uh, free time, but I, I did also uh, like a project, but it was uh, not a business project. It was actually like a, a school for French speaking kids. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an association, so it's an NPO. So we tried to do the, the crowdfunding things, mm -hmm. like the, the Japanese one. I don't remember. Campfire. Campfire. Mm -hmm. There was a nightmare to set up the. the mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, we couldn't do it. And now I have like a, maybe. 50 mails per week. <laughs> so I have no problem to send me email, but uh, lots of problems to reply to. So we didn't ha get any support, and I had to go to government to get support. So I feel you because it was all the same. Like to, for the project to go further, um, mailing on my uh, network, Facebook, didn't work. I had to go one per one. I had to contact everyone one per one, and it takes a lot, lot of time. It took me also two years to, to have my project uh, going on and started in January this year. So same, no money, nothing. <laughs> I feel you. Yeah, you, the planning is essential. So before you start a project, you really need to make the materials. Honestly, I'd say for, so, for crowdfunding, it's a minimum of probably two to one month lead in of contacting groups, not just individuals, but groups of people. Hey, I've got this project coming up soon. I need your support. Get as much publicity as you can so that from the moment that you launch excuse me, your campaign, mm -hmm. you've got 50 people already uh, pledging. Yeah, but the project has to be a business. Otherwise, you, it doesn't work on crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. And that's what I didn't know. I didn't know. And, and we spent, we lost time. Um, we lost maybe two months trying to do the crowdfunding things. And at the end, it's like, no, you're an association. So your project, we don't care your project, you know. So basically. This is where the analytics really uh, helps as well. So in my first version of my video, it was uh, like a four minute video. I had my son and I'm like, hi, I'm Mario. And this is my son. And, and I thought people would care that there was a father and son making this game and like no one cares. <laughs> so the first thing I'll tell you is no one cares about you, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, sh I shortened that video. I had a video, it was just like, hi, I'm Mario. This is my son, Felix. And then boom. Here's the game, and what I found was the shorter the videos were, the more people watched them and shared them. 
So you, you know, less is more. People's attention spans now are so short, they don't have time. So you really have to be concise in your messaging and understand that it's not about you, it's about what this product can do for the person that wants to purchase it. I've got a question on yep. the, um, the creative side of things. Like how, I suppose it's like asking somebody how, how, do you, how, how, how to become creative, there's no really answer, but how do you, let's say, okay, so the, the, the world, the story, all of that, like that, that's kind of comes natural or easy to me. How do you think about mechanics and, mm. and actual 3D design, like stuff? Have you done this kind of thing before? So the, an the answer to that is yes and no. So I don't have a background in, um, in design or anything like that. I'm not an artist. I've, I think I've naturally been artistic. When I was younger, I would draw things and my kid, my son as well. Um, when I was an English teacher, I used to make lesson plans. So I taught English in Japan at, at schools and I would make my own games for the kids I, you know, that I taught. So that was basically how I started. But um, I really think about balance. So this game, for me, it's important that it's balanced, meaning that if any given time, you have a chance to win and to lose. And that was what I spent most of my time in the mechanics, is balancing it so that, um, and there's a mechanic built into it that you actually can lose um, when you think you're going to win. And this is a game that punishes, punishes you actually when you do get overconfident, you get overly aggressive, you tend to actually lose uh, the game. So I would say, look at the world around you. I mean, if, if I showed you Pantheon and I, you saw the, the guy with the gas mask, and that was last year in America. <laughs> that, was, that was me looking at you know, people walking around with AR-15s and, and I just thought my country is on fire. Right, and so I just I just take from the world around me, and I just try to think of what's the message I want to share. So really, all of these things to me are Trojan horses. I, I really want to put a message in your brain, and I just need something fun so that you do that. I grew up in the '80s. I'm from Detroit. I'm obviously a black guy. Um, I watched a lot of TV as a kid, and people did not look like me on TV. So it was very important to me that when I got to a point where I could make something that I wanted people that looked like me, that looked like you, that looked like all of us. Mm -hmm. So for me, diversity is very important. And if you look on you know, version 1.1, 1 .1, there's a black woman on the box of my game. Can you, can you name any game that you've ever seen that has a black woman on the box? And you, you might have one or two, but I mean, it's super, super rare, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what I'm trying to do, is to make this a normal thing. This isn't a game for like black people, it's not a game for women, it's a game for all of us. But if you look at the characters on the back, you know, there's, there's all types of people. There's a giant guy with a, a slug on his shoulder, you know, there's, there's a variety of people. So that's the messaging that I want to put. And even Pantheon, it's a Greek mythology story, but they're all different. They're not all Greek. So, you know, it's important to me that we, we try to have as much diversity as we can um, and include as many people as possible. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the cost of the artwork and the, the, it's, I mean, it's expensive to go to a, a designer for one image. <laughs> to put all that stuff together must have probably cost a lot. So for uh, Golden Age of Pirates, I did all the work besides the characters and the, the vehicles and things like that. With the box, I designed both of those. And, but remember, with this, I did a profit share. So David has a percentage in this IP. Whatever this turns into, if it's an anime or a book, he gets a percentage of that. And this is what I was going to tell you, you know, you might not want to do that. So, you know, I hope you see this on Netflix, mm -hmm. and when you do, he's going to get a percentage of that. Even though he had nothing to do with me meeting the Netflix guy, all that negotiating, he had nothing to do with that. And they'll probably take his artwork and they'll throw it away. Mm -hmm. And they'll put their own, their own spin on it, mm -hmm. right? But because he helped me get that set up, he has a percentage. Pantheon is a different model. So I actually hired an artist and I pay per asset. So yeah, that's a, a great point, but um, two different approaches for both of those. Mm -hmm. My feeling is that in the end, Pantheon will be a better business model for me because I own it 100%. Mm -hmm. But you need the capital to go that way. Yes. Yeah. yes. How did you go about registering when you did the, the Pirates game, the IP? 
So like yeah. when you registered the trademarks and everything, did you use, I mean, you're here in Japan, did you use a Japanese law firm to sort of do the international trademarking or did yeah. you go individually country by country or how did you? No. Yeah, so you, you can go insane with trademarking. Sure. And what I would tell anybody is that there's two ways to do trademarking. Is mm -hmm. there's like the official way, which mm -hmm. is you get a registered trademark, right. or the poor man's way, which is just to have a paper trail of what you made put TM on it, which means it's just trademark. It doesn't mean it's a registered trademark. It doesn't cost you anything to do that. And if you have a friend like mine who takes your, you know, your kid and puts different clothes on them, the threat of that enough usually is enough to back them off. Um, but you're gonna, like someone's gonna copy my game at some point. And hopefully by that time, I have enough of a head start. People know that you know this was the original. And honestly, I've moved on to something else so that when it happens, it's not gonna look bankrupt. Um, but you know the trademarking is important, but I would not recommend to spend the money on it in the mm. beginning stages because mm. you don't know if it's going to be something that needs to be trademarked, sure. registered trademarked. That's a good point. So yeah, actually in terms of network, uh, being a member of a chamber of commerce, I don't say the French one, but um, it's very huge because it doesn't cost that much money to be a member per year. And the biggest advantage that you have, it they open you open like the network so you have access to the 600 uh, members and you can it's like a family like as soon as you say i'm a member i'll say oh me too and actually it creates a friendship it creates like uh, a connection a very strong connection that it's it's not nothing actually it's here's not the thing you have to be aware of is that at least with the american chamber is 50 percent of membership is japanese national so you don't have to be French or American same, or Australian. Same for the French one, right. actually. Um, and it's actually a better organization because of that, yes, right? Yeah. Because again, you're not meeting the same people every time. And out of that 50% that's not Japanese, only 25% of that is actually American, mm -hmm. right? The other 25 are, you know, French and German. They want countries. to connect to American business. Right. Okay. Because actually, I think the French, like the American one, we are strong everywhere in the world. We have chamber everywhere in the world, for example. What I say to the people is like, um, even a, um, a Japanese company who want to do business in Morocco, for example, nothing to do with France. But because we have a huge network in Japan and in Morocco, it's better to go through the French Chamber of Commerce than to go through Jetro, maybe, or mm -hmm. through the Moroccan uh, Chamber of Commerce. How much are membership fees typically for either of those? It depends if you go as, a, as an individual. There's different levels, yeah, but different the cheapest levels. one might be around, uh, say, 50,000 yen a year. Mm -hmm. The highest level will be around 250,000. Oh, the individual or business? Or yeah, yeah. yeah, I'd say start off as a small, medium enterprise, which yeah. might cost you like around 60,000, 70,000 a year. But mm -hmm. the American one is when you go, you go individu individually or the entire company is member. There's different levels. So there's individual membership, which is just like if I'm, you know, Joe's Rib Shack. Yeah. Um, and then there's a company membership, which is, you know, Joe's Rib Shack Incorporated, uh -huh. with two uh, members that are uh -huh. under that under that. Yeah, team. so that's why it's a difference with uh, the American one and the French one. The French one is you become a member, the entire company is member, actually. Mm -hmm. And we have different prices if you're in Tokyo or outside Tokyo, because it's not the same benefits. Right. Especially in the mind of the Japanese people, for Japanese people, uh, Shoko Kaisho, uh, mm -hmm. Chamber of Commerce, it's normally for two Shokigyo, like small and medium company, not for big one. Mm -hmm. But what people mm -hmm. don't know is like, Chamber of Commerce is not a company, it's NPO basically. Mm -hmm. So um, it survives because of the memberships. And you need the support of very, very big corporates. So in France, we also have like, we have Louis Vuitton, Moët Chandon, Bacala, we have all these big corporates, but they are like board of, board, board of director and they pay a membership, but not for the services. They pay this membership just to support our existence. Mm -hmm. That will support small and medium business to do network and develop their business. Yeah, I, I can't stress it enough. I mean, um, you know, like you mentioned Louis Vuitton, I met the president of Louis Vuitton He's at an guy, ACCJ actually. dinner, mm -hmm. sitting next to me. Um, and before I knew it, it was I was bringing in their expats mm -hmm. when I was in relocation services. So, mm -hmm. so because you're in a group like that, yeah. the people that are around you, um, they don't. You don't come across as a salesperson. I'm just eating dinner, and oh, by the way, let me move in all your expats. And then, you know, so I do suggest um, that if you have a friend as well that's a member, maybe have them invite you to an event. That won't cost you anything, and at least you'll have a chance to, to see the, the quality of the, the pool that you. And I think the American and the French are the same way. It's very friendly, actually. Even if you meet like very top top level people, they are so friendly. Last time I was talking with a guy, and at the end I say, 
Okay, that's like the biggest pharmaceutical uh, <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> but no, no, that's very friendly. And for the game, like I go back, the game, I, I read somewhere that the French people are like the, the more than Japanese, they buy manga, anime, mm -hmm. all these mm -hmm. things, like one of the... Uh, the, yeah, the biggest in, in the world, like yeah. using all the... So your game, so, you need to put it in French. <laughs> so, yeah, actually, uh, if, uh, there were two slides. That One of them is that, that little chart that shows that in how manga interest now is, is higher. Um, you know. So, uh, Kimetsu no Yaiba, right? So Demon Slayer was the number one film in America this year. I would think they grossed more money in America than they did in Japan, just because of the, the population difference, right? So, I think you're going to start to see that manga, anime, makes more money abroad than it does in Japan. Which is what I want my company to be able to to help companies bridge the gap to, to get to larger audiences around the world. But France, for some reason, is huge for board games mm -hmm. and for um, yeah. and for manga, right? And you have to go to Germany as well. Germany is well. Germany. Yeah. I think the board games pretty much European things. Yeah. 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 You have to go to the Japan Expo. Yeah. We have this big forum in France, like Japan Expo, and they bring. You actually also can get buy a lot of. German board games here in Japan. So basically, when you when you go to especially to the to the more specialized board games, mm -hmm. a lot of them are actually directed from Germany because we are actually making a lot of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's a different in cultures. I mean, most people maybe in Japan, you know, they get their friends together. They're not playing cards against humanity or something, you know. But in the West, it's very common for for college mm -hmm. students, for people in their thirties, forties, to play board games. So. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, makes it difficult to get your product out in Japan because kids don't really play board games. My son plays my game because he made it, but I don't see him playing anything else. It's Nintendo Switch. So this actually, my plan is to have this turn into a Nintendo Switch game, you know, hopefully within the next one or two years. Um, you know, but I'm, I'm very aware that this probably won't be a huge hit in Japan. Right? My audience has to be a lot older and international for that but it's card, card game. Card game yeah. with the book, yeah? no? Which is why my second product is a yeah. card battle game, yeah. right? But again, I don't expect Japanese because it's Greek mythology, mm -hmm. um, and the characters are not all like Final Fantasy, like bleached mm -hmm. blonde hair. And, mm -hmm. So again, my idea is anime style, but advertising it to Western audiences mm -hmm. because they like anime style. But oh, I know who Zeus is, mm -hmm. so that's the idea. Thank you very much. Um.